everyone. Happy Tuesday and happy So What Day. I hope you're having a great start to your week and that you are ready to dive into some embroidery techniques and some fun project ideas because that's what I have in store for you today. Uh, before we get started, though, I have been informed that we have a very select few mystery boxes that we decided to bring back to you here today on So What. There are very, very few still available. So if you were one of the ones who emailed me about not being able to get one last week, you can get one today. Um, if you're not familiar with our mystery boxes, we release them with the seasons. So this is our 2023 spring mystery box, and it includes a lot of notions and fun gift ideas and, of course, sulky thread and stabilizers so that you are all stocked up for your spring makes. So if you were able to grab up our mystery box last week when we launched them on the first day of spring, let me know in the chat and in the comments and tell me how you liked your mystery box because they're kind of one of my favorite things. I, I love being surprised. I love opening a box and, and you know having it feel like it's Christmas and you get to enjoy everything that's inside. So let me know if you grabbed one last week and if you didn't, you still have a chance here during the So What program to go over to sulky.com and shop that mystery box and grab one uh, because as you know, once they're gone, they're gone. They're very limited edition. And um, I think you're really going to enjoy this box. They are super fun. I love that everybody's coming on and saying hello. Um, hello from Wisconsin. Hello from San Diego. You've gotten a lot of rain uh, recently. So glad you're having a sunny day. We've got California. Hey, Deb. <laughs> All right. Sharon says, I received my mystery box and my Chateau Coat kit. Was fun looking at the context, uh, contents. Nancy got her mystery box. Uh, Christy says, I loved it. Very neat stuff and a cool color palette. All right. Well, thanks for sharing, everybody. Grab up those mystery boxes while you can because um, it's over $54, I believe, worth of goodies and you're getting it for only $34.99. So it's a great deal. And like I said, super fun. I love little sewing gadgets and fun sewing notions and little gifties from Sulky, like I said, so you'll really enjoy it. Speaking of the Chateau kit, thanks for bringing that up because we're only a couple of weeks away from our Chateau Coat video cast with the Sewing Workshop Pattern Collection. This video cast is also in partnership with the American Sewing Guild. So lots of fun to be had on April 11th, 2023 at 2 p.m. Eastern Time. We will be live streaming this video cast. And if you don't know the difference between a sulky video cast and a sulky webcast, Maybe I should explain all that to you. So a video cast is a longer event. It's 90 minutes of content. Sometimes we even go over the 90 minutes because we're live streaming and we have lots of cameras going on. Um, and there's just so much to share about the techniques and the projects. Um, but they are, in general, about 90 minutes long. And you get a class from the pattern designer themselves. So Alex Woodbury from the Sewing Workshop is going to come and join us, and she's going to take us through the tips for creating the Chateau coat. This coat has dolman sleeves. It has a very forgiving fit. Um, it looks great on all figures. You can belt it. You can let it uh, be loose and flowy. Uh, we are making it out of a featherweight scuba knit fabric. So if you've ever worked with scuba fabric before, a lot of the times it can be kind of this spongy, like neoprene uh, type fabric, basically what you would go scuba diving in, right? Well, this featherweight scuba fabric 
has this really designer, luxurious feel to it, but it's lighter weight than that neoprene scuba. So it's really great for a springy garment. You can also wear it in the summer months, and then you can layer it up and wear it in the fall and winter time as well. Because it has such of a forgiving fit and is so, um, you know, open and flowy, you can layer garments underneath. Um, it is meant for about a three quarter sleeve length. So you can wear, you know, a longer sleeve underneath and have that peeking out for a pop of color. There's just so many different ways of wearing and enjoying this garment. So I have a few images to show you so you can see the fit of the garment and you can kind of see, it's a little hard to see on this charcoal scuba knit color, um, but that line running down the back of the garment is actually decorative top stitching. We're gonna go over the lapped seam techniques for creating the coat. It's a super simple technique for when you don't have to finish the seams of a garment. So this comes together really quickly because the neoprene, or excuse me, the, the uh, featherweight scuba doesn't fray. So you don't have to spend all this time finishing the seams because along your straight cuts, those are just going to remain nice and straight. So we're going to do a lapped seam technique. We're going to do triple stitching. We're going to learn decorative top stitching techniques. We're also going to also going to learn some hand embroidery stitches that you can use along your seams or on some optional patch pockets. So this is uh, already designed for slit pockets on the side because yes, we need pockets, especially in a coat like this. So we're going to learn that technique, but you can also do patch pockets in the front if you don't want side slip pockets. And on those patch pockets, it's a great canvas for hand embroidery or even machine embroidery or more decorative top stitching. So that's where you can really add your personality to the garment as well. So we have, oh, here's another um, image of it from the front. So you can see it has kind of a collar, but it's flowy. Um, and as I mentioned, you could belt it for a little bit tighter fit, or you can leave it hanging and nice and flowy. Um, and there is the, the length of the sleeve. Like I mentioned, you could wear a long sleeve underneath for the cooler weather months, or you can leave it short sleeve, wear a tank underneath, and wear it out and about. It's great for work wear, but you can also dress it up for a more elegant look. Uh, so it's a really versatile garment that looks great, as I said, on all figures. So we have three colorways of the kit available, and the kit includes that wonderfully luxurious high-end featherweight scuba knit fabric, and it also includes three spools of thread. One of the spools of thread is used for construction. That is the spool of thread that matches the fabric. Then we have another spool of thread that's used for the decorative top stitching by machine. And then we have a third spool of thread, and that is the spool of blendables thread that we're going to use for the hand embroidery accents and the optional hand embroidery on the patch pockets. You could also use that heavyweight thread for the top stitching by machine, but you will need a little bit larger needle eye to use that thread if you're gonna be using it for uh, machine sewing. So we're gonna go all over all those techniques on April 11th at 2 p.m. Eastern time. Uh, the kit also comes with a pack of super stretch needles. These are the needles we're gonna to use to construct and do the top stitching on the garment. You can do this garment on your regular sewing machine, or if you have a serger, you can also use your serger to construct the garment. Um, and you can actually use the uh, very colorful thread in the loopers and the thread that matches the garment in the needles. And then you will have a very decorative look on the inside 
uh, where you have your exposed seam uh, or seams. Now, if you choose to use a serger, uh, you will not use that lap seam technique, uh, but it's a really great technique to learn and be familiar with and uh, just get the hang of it because it's so, so smart and makes for a really designer, high-end looking piece. All right, so we have this charcoal gray version of the kit. Um, I really can't tell which one I like the best. We also have this Acru uh, version of the kit. This is a really great neutral color uh, for all things springy, summery. And then imagine wearing this color in the winter, uh, even with, you know, some dark gray or black, um, you know, long sleeve underneath. It would look really striking. And then we also have a black version of the kit. The black version comes with red and brick red uh, threads for the decorative top stitching and optional hand embroidery. Uh, let's see, the A Crew comes with a purple and hydrangea color of thread. And then the gray comes with rose and vintage rose color thread. So lots of different options to suit all different tastes, all different, um, you know, neutrals that will go with a lot of things in your existing closet. So let me go ahead and address some of the questions that have come in. Let's see. Someone asked, um, oh, Cecilia says, this is my style of jacket. <laughs> oh, Sue says, could this be made in fleece? Um, you know, I, I would think so. Um, it's really designed for no fray fabrics, but there are also instructions in the pattern, excuse me, in the pattern for um, binding your seams if you are using a fabric that frays. Now, I know that fleece fabric doesn't fray, um, but it's also suggested to use like a wool fabric, a wool melton fabric, um, things like this. So I would assume that a fleece would work out okay. I would go with a lighter weight fleece myself, but I am a person who runs really hot. Um, but I would imagine it would be just like wearing a cozy blanket if you made it out of the fleece. All right. Colleen says, got my kit and marked it on my calendar. Perfect. That is excellent. Um, oh, Karen got her mystery box and hasn't even opened it yet. You have some commitment. Um, I envy you <laughs> because I would not be able to wait. That is great. Michelle says she's received her Chateau coat kit. Perfect. Oh, Betsy says Linda Lee is also talking about this class right now. Amazing. Love it. So Linda Lee and I go way back to my So News days. Linda used to do a regular column in So News, so I used to get to talk to her all the time. I know. What a treat. She is fantastic. Um, Alex Woodbury is her daughter, who has been uh, with the Sewing Workshop for a long, long time and does a lot, a lot of their videos. So she is the one that's going to be joining us for the video cast. Um, and if you are grabbing up that mystery box and you want to get to your free shipping threshold, don't we all? I hate spending money on shipping. Put that show, Chateau Coat kit in your cart as well, and you will be on your way to free shipping and you can get that mystery box. I always look at it as, you know, 10 or 15 bucks of free product. When I have to pay for shipping, I might as well add some more stuff to the cart. All right. <laughs> Karen says, I think today is the time to open up that mystery box. I need a treat today. I hear ya. Oh, Sharon says, is the coat program designed as a sew along or just for watching? So the video casts are not uh, sew alongs because they're only 90 minutes long and we couldn't possibly get through all the techniques and the entire construction of the jacket in that 90 minutes. So we give you the tips that are uh, most used for the coat construction, as well as those optional embellishments. And then you can go back once you have your kit, watch the video cast again on demand, 
You can pause, fast forward, rewind as you're working your way through the coat. And then you can do kind of your own sew along. But we don't expect you to keep up with us. We will have everything pre-cut. We have step outs that um, show different parts of the project as we move forward so that we can get through it all in that 90 minutes. So that was a long answer to your short question. <laughs> Um, no, it's not meant as a sew along, but you do have access to that 90 minute video so that you can go and review all of those things if you don't purchase your kit in advance um, or if you want that help, um, you know, Alex with you step by step while you're working your way through the coat, um, you can do kind of your own little sew along. So hopefully uh, that makes sense. Jennifer says, this is the first time I have watched one of these. I thought this was on red work. That is what it says. Okay, good segue, Jennifer. It is about red work today. I just wanted to make sure everyone was aware of our video cast coming up on April 11th, 2023 at 2 p.m. Eastern time. So be sure and register. I put the link to register for that video cast in the description of today's post and the link to the kit and all of that is in the comments. So if you're not seeing any of that, be sure to hit that little see more button and the whole description will pop out. You'll see links for everything I'm talking about today, as well as project links for a number of fun Easter themed projects that you might wanna get working on so that you're ready in a couple of weeks for Easter. Cecilia says, is the pattern included in the kit? So for our Chateau kit, you have the option of adding the digital pattern, the physical pattern, or no pattern to your kit purchase. So go to the kit page and you'll see a little drop down menu. So if you do want the pattern included with your kit, just select which type of pattern you want, whether you want the digital pattern or the physical pattern delivered with your kit, and then we'll take care of the rest for you. All right, Luann says, I love red work, so let's get started. All right, so today, as Jennifer mentioned, we are talking about red work embroideries. Red work is somewhat of a, well, it is a vintage type of embroidery. Um, and I did post this uh, tutorial or a little bit more about red work and you know where it kind of came from on the Sulky blog. And I linked directly to that blog post. So if you're looking for direct links or more information on red work, that's a good resource for you today. So um, let's see, red work is really from the 19th century uh, when red thread uh, was kind of the first type of dye used on threads. Um, and let's see, I have some notes I'm referring to here. So specifically Turkey red was uh, imported from Europe around that time after the industrial revolution. And this red thread was used to embroider various household good, goods, mostly towels. Um, flower sack type towels even, you would find a lot of vintage red work um, embroideries on those items. You'll have to excuse me, my nose is running a little bit. It's a little cold down here in my office today. So uh, apologies, excuse me. <laughs> All right, so most um, red work designs actually depicted people doing household chores. Right, so if you remember any towels that maybe you grew up with, I know my grandmother had a set of little hankies with you know ladies sewing, ladies doing the laundry, ladies baking bread, things like this. So these were very popular motifs around that time. Um, also depicting children, children playing with toys, um, children you know playing with little. Um, train sets, things like that, even um, birds and then state flowers um, kind of came into play as well. 
Um, so if you ever find these vintage patterns, consider yourself really lucky because they are from the early 19th century. Um, and interestingly enough, I thought it was interesting, uh, these patterns often were inside of the newspaper. So you could actually, you know, find them weekly, monthly, however often you got your paper and have these great little red work inspired vintage -y. Well, I guess they weren't vintage at the time, <laughs> um, but red work style designs. Um, so it's popular today still and has been, you know, ever since it began. I think it just gives us that warm, fuzzy feeling and, you know, that sort of feeling of nostalgia that we get, you know, I mentioned my grandmother's hankies. Um, it just makes us remember those times. So I think that we all kind of, you know, love this red work style. A lot of quilters will do red work in their entire quilt. And now it kind of has a broader term. It doesn't really necessarily only mean embroidery. You can do red work quilting and have your quilt entirely quilted out of red threads. Um, you know, different motifs. There's even, you know, modern style red work. So, um, you know, I think that it's really beautiful to choose different shades of red thread as opposed to just using one color like the turkey red that was used when that, you know, color first came out and everyone was just so taken with it um, because it was just so different and something that they weren't able to use previously. So at Sulky, we have a variety of red work thread samplers. So really handy to grab these up and you have all sorts of red shades from light to dark. So you can do a red work design and switch out these thread colors to create dimension, shading, things like that. You could do the lettering in a darker shade of red and then the motif in a lighter shade of red. We also have red blendables thread. Um, there's one called red brick that I was talking about earlier, and that's available in our 30 weight or 12 weight cotton threads. And that way you can use one strand of thread, but there's lots of red shades, um, you know, across the thread length. So every two and a half to five inches, the thread is randomly dyed. So I really love using that red brick color. I've used it a lot. I think that's one that I continually reorder from Sulky. Um, so anyways, we've got this particular red work sampler that has six shades of red. And this is for handwork, really. It's our 12 weight cotton thread. Uh, but you can also just search red work on the Sulky site and you'll find some other thread weights as well if you want to go for a sampler. Um, before I move forward, I do see another comment about uh, our Chateau coat. Um, let's see, disappointing pictures of the jacket, only a couple of side views. Even a pattern envelope gives full front and full back views. Okay, thank you for that feedback. Um, if you do wanna see more images of that coat, you can go on over to the registration page um, and there is the view of the pattern envelope, which is a sketch. And then there's also a couple more views to show you the coat on a model um, in that uh, ecru colorway as well. So you might be able to see a little bit more uh, views of the coat. Um, so just to make sure, so here's the back view of that Chateau coat. You can see that dolman sleeve style um, and the nice collar shape. And then here's a side view of that coat. And then here is the front view of that coat. So on our website at sewingonline.sulky.com, you'll also find some more detail shots of the side pocket and you can see the decorative top stitching using those contrasting threads um, and a few other photos as well. So hopefully that'll give you a little bit better view of the coat and you can decide if you want to join us on April 11th to learn how to make it. Okay, so back to the red work, back to the red work. Um, all right, so here is what that sampler looks like. 
It's our cotton petite thread, as I mentioned, that we like to use for handwork. And since red work really started as a hand embroidery technique, I thought we would start by um, talking about the handwork threads. But as I mentioned, um, you know, since we've modernized all kinds of embroidery, our home sweet home machine embroidery collection includes all of these great red work inspired designs, but for machine embroidery. I know, I'm gonna give that a round of applause. <laughs> because whenever I mention hand embroidery, I always get quite a few of you saying, I wish I could do this so much faster on my machine. So we have the Home Sweet Home Machine Embroidery Collection, and we also have the Home Sweet Home Hand Embroidery Collection. All of these designs were uh, designed by Carol Ingram. She is just a gem, a gem. She's no longer with us and we love her so much, um, but she lives on in a lot of her designs and this is one great collection. Um, it includes days of the week, so Monday through Friday. It also includes a Valentine's Day design, one that says home sweet home, and then one for flag day, which is gonna be here you know, before you know it. So I'll show you these a little bit closer up. Um, this is clean on Friday. If only we still did these things, right? Every day of the week, had a chore for every day of the week. Um, it might be easier to manage. <laughs> so here's the flag day design, the home sweet home. And I would like to mention the flag day design, the home sweet home, these are great sizes for a tea towel, a flower sack towel, um, any kind of hand towel, really, because they have that sort of, um, you know, skinny, narrow um, uh, design size. And I'll show you that in a little bit as well. Iron on Tuesday. My grandmother used to iron the sheets even. Anybody out there still iron their sheets? I just, I can't be bothered with that. I, I, I just permanent press on the dryer, put them on the bed as soon as possible. No way am I ironing those sheets. <laughs> so on Wednesday, of course, this is one of my favorite designs. Here's a Valentine's Day design. She's creating a little Valentine um, at the foot of a tree. Love that. Very sweet. Visit on Thursday. And then we have wash on Monday. I should have put these in order. They would have made more sense. Washing, ironing, etc. <laughs> All right. So for the machine embroidery designs, they are digitized for our 40 weight rayon thread. You could also use 40 weight poly deco thread if you prefer to use polyester thread for your machine embroideries, especially on things like towels and linens that are gonna get washed a lot. Um, but I find that the rayon uh, performs pretty well in the washing machine as well. It gives that nice lustrous sheen uh, to the embroideries and um, they turn out really great. So all of those designs are also available for hand embroidery. Oh. And here's that red brick thread I was talking about. See how it's all of those colors of red, but on one spool. So you could use this 30 weight uh, cotton thread for these embroideries as well. But for the lettering, you might want to go to that 40 weight rayon or 40 weight poly deco thread just so that you can see it really well. I find with lettering, you need a little bit lighter weight thread um, unless your lettering's going really large. And that way you're just gonna be able to read it really nicely. All right. So as I mentioned, um, looks great on a towel. We have all kinds of towel blanks at sulky.com. This is a really great one for red work because it already has that decorative strip on it that includes little red thread dots. So it coordinates with this collection very, very well. We also have some other towels that have a colored border to them um, and it's hem stitched on there. So it gives you that little bit vintage quality um, to the hand towel itself. And then we also have flower sack towels 
as well. And you can grab those up in multi-packs if you want to create several of these. Maybe make all the days of the week or, you know, the Monday through Friday um, and gift them to somebody special. So that would be a really, really uh, great thing to do maybe for Mother's Day coming up as well. Uh, somebody's asking, if you don't have 40 weight thread, will 50 weight work? Um, you know, for, for a design like this, I would say that 50 weight thread will work as well. You could use our 50 weight cotton thread. Um, and the only reason I say that is because it's a very open design. There isn't a lot of fill stitches. Um, so you won't have spaces between those stitches when you use a lighter weight thread. Um, if you had a design that had a lot of dense fill stitch or decorative fill stitches, um, you know, maybe it's like a basket weave fill stitch, that 50 weight thread wouldn't fill in all of those spaces um, as much as a thicker 40 weight thread would. So that's when you get kind of space between the thread where you can see the fabric underneath. Um, that means that you've used a thread that's too light for that particular stitch. But for these, since they're mostly line art, um, I would say the 50 weight thread would work nicely. I would also use the 50 weight thread in the bobbin. Um, and if you're using a, a heavier weight thread, I'd go with a 50 or 60 weight thread in the bobbin as well. Um, and that being said, you know, in something like a towel, you're going to be seeing the wrong side of this. So you might want to match your thread color on the wrong side with the thread color on the right side. And when you're doing red work, that's usually just one thread um, or maybe two if you're using a couple different shades of red. Um, so I would use that same red thread in the bobbin so that when you flip over the towel and you're using it and whatnot, or if you happen to glance and see it, it looks just as pretty on the wrong side as it does on the right side. Also, stabilizer. So when we are um, embroidering things like towels, especially these types of towels, those flat, I keep wanting to say flower sack, but um, those lighter weight, you know, hand towels or linen towels um, that have a more open weave to them. We need a good amount of stabilizer, but we want it to totally disappear and be gone once our embroidery is complete because we are, again, going to be seeing the wrong side of this um, and using it, right? So what I have found really works best for me is using Sulky Fabrisolvi. Fabrisolvi is a wash away fabric-like stabilizer. It feels almost like fabric, but it's made of these compressed fibers that dissipate um, under running water. So they will wash away entirely when your embroidery is complete. You might need to use two layers of Fabrisolvi just so that your fabric is nice and stabilized in that hoop. All right, so Fabrisolvi. Now, I wouldn't use sticky Fabrisolvi per se, um, but you could, especially if you're embroidering something that you really can't hoop. So let's say you wanted to also put a monogram or something on the bottom border of your towel and you can't get that in the hoop. You could use sticky Fabrisolvi, hoop only the sticky Fabrisolvi, and then score the paper inside your inner hoop ring using your sticky plus slitting pen. Who out there already has a sticky plus slitting pen? I tell you what, um, I should have stock in this thing because I love it so much. This slitting pen has a very sharp point to it and it is manufactured so that it only goes through the paper backing on your sticky stabilizers. It doesn't go through the stabilizer itself. You would have to really go at it for it to puncture that stabilizer. And if you've ever done hoopless embroidery before or hooped a sticky stabilizer to put your item on it, you will know the struggle of trying to score that paper without slicing through the stabilizer beneath it. Because once you do that, you've ruined the stabilizer. You have to get a new piece 
And you always save that stabilizer piece thinking you can use it for something else, but it can be wasteful and costly. So sticky plus slitting pen. These are relatively inexpensive. They're like seven bucks at sulky.com. You will thank me for it. I'm telling you what. So it has a little protective um, tip on it because again, it's very sharp. Um, so you'll score the paper backing of your sticky Fabrisolvi using your sticky plus slitting pen. Then you'll remove the paper backing along those scored lines and place your towel in the hoop centering, you know, where you want your design to be. So you could use sticky Fabrisolvi if you were embroidering on a, an area of the towel that's not hoopable. All right. Um, Mary is saying, I cannot find the towels. I posted a link to our blanks section of the Sulky website, but I think we can add um, a link directly to our towel blanks in the chat here. Um, so if you don't have your sticky plus slitting pen, I'm telling you what, add that to your cart today along with your mystery box, get up to your free shipping and you will thank me for it. Heather Ha is saying, love it. All right, Debbie has never seen it before. Nancy says, I have the slitting pen and love it. Uh, Leslie got one in a mystery box. So perfect, perfect. All right. Um, yes, Mary says, Fabrisolvi is not too light. So yes, you might want um, a couple of layers of the Fabrisolvi depending on the weight of your towel. So if your towel's very lightweight, I would do two layers of Fabrisolvi in the hoop. They will both wash away entirely once your embroidery is complete. Um, after embroidery, I always trim the stabilizer just beyond the outer stitching perimeter, um, just to you know give me less to have to wash away. And when you're using a wash away stabilizer, whether it's Fabra Solvi, Original Solvi, Super Solvi, Ultra Solvi, you can use your scraps and put them into a spray bottle, add about a cup of water at a time, depending on how many scraps you have, and dissolve them in your spray bottle. Now you have a liquid stabilizer that you can use for other projects. And I'm actually gonna talk about that momentarily. So all those bits of Fabrisolvi and Solvi and things like that that you're tearing away, save those, store them in a spray bottle, and then when it comes time that you need um, a spray Solvi or a spray stabilizer, add your water until it makes kind of a, a cloudy liquid and you can adjust the strength based on you know the project that you need it for. But that is also great to use on something like a very lightweight towel. You can spray your towel with this liquid Solvi and then hoop it with some more Fabra Solvi and that sucker will be really great for embroidery. And it will also prevent your hoop from marring the fabric. Sometimes when you are working, especially with a linen towel or a fabric that has a more open weave to it, once you hoop it, if you go a little bit too tight, it will actually separate the weave of the fabric along your hoop ring. And then when you go to pop your uh, towel or fabric out of the hoop, those, fa those fibers wanna go back where they were before. And that is how you get puckering around your embroidery when you have thought, I stabilized this to the nines. It looked great in the hoop. What's going on? It's because along your hoop ring, those fibers have gotten stretched by the hooping process. So if you're worried about that, you can do the hoopless embroidery using that sticky Fabrisolvi or you can use a liquid Solvi before you hoop your towel or fabric, um, or you can try just two layers of the Fabra Solvi um, and just you know maybe spraying around where it's gonna be hooped so that that, those, that fabric weave stays together um, and is nice and stable. All right. Yes, thank you for adding the towel blanks. 
um, link right there in the comments. So if you're looking for these particular uh, towels that I'm showing you, you'll find them there. So this is a great one that has a little loop to it. Um, I probably should have done the embroidery in the um, other orientation so that when you hang your towel, your embroidery is oriented properly. I know, live and learn, live and learn. That's why we do the so what here so I can make all the mistakes and then you can go embroider it properly. <laughs> um, but anyways, uh, that little hanging loop is always um, a must for me on towels. You could actually add a little hanging loop and bind your towel with some decorative um, you know, cotton fabric from your stash. Or if you have some leftover quilt binding, you can bind your own cotton towel after you add your machine embroidery and add your own little hanging loop to it. And then you can tie in some more color and personality um, and fun to the project. Sharon is saying, what about using a magnetic hoop? Perfect. So I love my magnetic hoops. They have changed my life. <laughs> I know that sounds drastic, but they are really the best thing to happen to machine embroidery because we can use magnetic hoops and hoop everything that we couldn't hoop before. Fabrics like denim, fabrics like linen, fabrics like fleece can now be hooped in a magnetic hoop without any hoop burn, without marring the fabric. You can hoop just the collar of a jacket onto a sheet of stabilizer, embroider it out. It, it's phenomenal. There are still instances where I will use a sticky stabilizer with a magnetic hoop as well, um, just for extra assurances that my item isn't gonna go anywhere. They're also great for end-to-end -end or edge-to-edge -edge quilting. Um, just, I mean, I can't say enough about magnetic hoops. If you don't have one and you wanna check them out, we have them at sulky.com. Um, basically, you plug in your machine brand, then you plug in your make and model, and then it's gonna tell you uh, what size hoops are available for your particular machine. And they are compatible with your embroidery unit. So they talk to your embroidery unit just like your other hoops. So, it, 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 I mean, honestly, I can't say enough about them. And yes, you can use them for projects like these. All right, so in addition to towels, things of that nature, oh, I should also mention for the towels like the ones I showed you, you do not need to use a topper because the fabric doesn't have any nap. Um, it doesn't have any plush fibers like a terry cloth towel would. If you are using a terry cloth towel, you wanna be sure to also use Sulky Solvi. Solvi is the stabilizer that looks like a film, right? But it's pretty lightweight. You want to use Solvi and not a product like Press and Seal or Plastic Wrap. You never want to use plastic in your machine that can get caught inside and ruin your big investment of your precious embroidery machine. At any rate, I will get off my soapbox about that. So Sulky Original Solvi is what you want to use as a topper. Um, if your fabric can withstand the heat of an iron, which terry cloth, fleece, things like that, no, no, you want to use the wash away. We also have heat away clear film, um, which is also used as a topper. But in the instance of, let's say, a terry cloth or nappy style of towel, you want to use Sulky Solvi over the top before you begin the embroidery. And I always attach that using a little bit of Sulky KK2000 Temporary Spray Adhesive. I actually spray the Solvi, which yes, you can spray it and it won't start dissolving, with the KK2000 and then I place it over the top of my fabric or towel in the hoop. If you're using a magnetic hoop, you can sandwich that in the magnetic hoop as well and then you can begin your embroidery. Then when you uh, go to wash away your Fabra Solvi, your Solvi on top will also wash away. Um, sometimes with a thicker towel, I'll use a different stabilizer like a Tear Easy, and I'll tear that away after the embroidery is complete. It really depends on, again, the weight of the towel. Um, all right, so 
Solvi. Oh, the other reason why I spray the Solvi rather than spraying the item is if you spray the Solvi, when you go to remove the Solvi under the running water, the spray comes with the Solvi. If you spray your towel with the Solvi and then, or with the KK2000, then place your Solvi on top, a little bit of that KK is going to remain on the towel. Now, KK2000 is air soluble. So it's going to dissipate in the air after about 48, 72 hours or so. Um, so you just leave it alone, let it dissipate, um, and it will be gone. All right. So along with towels, um, you know, pillows are great blanks, especially for designs like these. Um, I love this. Now, this design is not quite this large. This is about an 18 inch, I think, pillow form. So you've got to use software if you want to enlarge the design to be this big. But pillow blanks are great. We have some pillow blanks that actually have an envelope style closure on the back where the two sides close like an envelope and then the top and bottom edges close like an envelope and then they're secured with a button. So when you go to do your embroidery, you simply open up the entire pillow, embroider right on the center, and then fold it around your, uh, your pillow form. You can also use existing pillows. Maybe you have pillows that came with your couch, something like that, and cover them with these types of blanks. And you can swap out for different holidays, different you know decor styles, things like that, super easily. We also have some pillow blank styles that have a zipper on the bottom. So you would turn those uh, wrong side out and then you're basically embroidering in almost like a tunnel. So your machine with the needle on it is gonna go kind of inside of this tunnel and you're gonna kind of hold it out of place while the embroidery is working. Then when you're all done, you of course will remove all the stabilizer turn it right side out, insert your pillow or pillow form, and you're good to go. So pillow blanks that are specifically made uh, for machine embroidery are the ones I suggest, uh, but you could also very simply make your own 18 inch pillow using some fabrics from your stash. All right, so as I mentioned, all of these designs are also available as hand embroidery designs. So if you purchase the hand embroidery collection, you will get a full size template for each design and you can print that directly onto our sheets of Sulky Stick and Stitch Stabilizer. Stick and Stitch is similar to Sticky Fabrisolvi, which I was just talking about, but Stick and Stitch comes in eight and a half by 11 inch uh, sheets so you can put them in your printer. So you'll want to set your printer for its lowest ink setting if you have that capability, just because you don't really need to oversaturate the stabilizer with ink. You just need to be able to see your design. So you will print on the fabric-like side of the stick and stitch, and then you will trim your design. Just leave yourself a little bit of a border beyond the outer design perimeter stick the stick and stitch directly to the item you want to hand embroider, right on the right side, whether it's a pillow blank, a towel, what have you. Then you'll do your hand embroidery following your design, and when everything is done, you will wash away the stick and stitch under running water. Then you can roll up your towel or item, what have you, in a towel to remove the excess water and let it dry flat. And what an easy way to transfer embroidery designs. So that being said, I do want to um, give you some tips for using red threads specifically for this hand embroidery technique where we're working with that stick and stitch. Because, you know, imagine that you are, you got a red t-shirt, right? you would never wash that red t-shirt for the first time with a bunch of white clothes. We all know what happens then, right? Everything turns pink. 
Well, even though Sulky Thread is of the utmost quality and it has gone through many rinse cycles, there is still going to be the likelihood that you will have a bit of excess dye from red threads specifically and even darker threads like, you know, the jet black threads. So to avoid uh, the red dye transferring to your blank, you really want to rinse away that stabilizer with loads of water. You want it rushing off of the project. You don't want to let it sit and pool, okay? Because what's going to happen if that red thread um, decides to leak, what have you, um, you know, through that rinsing process, it'll lift up in the water and then it'll settle on some part of your pristinely white towel blank and nobody wants that, right? So you'll want to hold your item at kind of an angle and let that water really rush over the top, making sure that it's running, running, running until the stabilizer is gone, all right? And then even after it's gone, I give it a cool water rinse um, under the running water again and again and again, making sure that the water is running clear before I'm done washing it away. Then you can, you know, roll it up in a towel to get rid of the excess moisture. You really want to get rid of the excess moisture so that the dye doesn't kind of bleed a little bit along uh, the thread edges. Now, I'm saying this and you might be freaking out, like, how could the thread possibly do this? But I just feel like we should err on the side of caution. Sometimes I will wash away red thread, black thread, um, you know, stabilizer on those threads and nothing happens at all. Sometimes I've had it bleed just a tiny bit beyond the thread on the item. In those cases, I will let the item dry thoroughly and then I use a spot remover product like um, you might use grandma's spot remover. That's a really good one. Or even a stick of Fells naphtha. Um, that works really good because you can just rub it along the side of the thread and then you can wash the item and it will come out. So if it does end up happening, you have, you know, some recourse. You can you can make your item look great again. Um, but really just make sure you're running, 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 running the water over those threads when you're removing that type of stabilizer. Um, it's very important. I just don't want to have anybody's hard work um, after all that hand embroidery uh, to come, you know, crashing down on you with a little bit of red dye. Um, so just, you know, be on the lookout for that. Um, some people in the past have, you know, spritzed their item to get rid of the stabilizer because maybe they don't want to wash the entire item or they're gifting it away or something like that. And that's probably the worst thing you can do with these types of thread um, because it's just going to saturate everything and just make it, you know, if it is going to bleed, it's definitely going to bleed in a big way if you just spritz it with water. Um, so lots of uh, running water like that. Colleen is asking, does perfect applique come in printer sheets? Um, it does not. Right now we have one yard packs, three yard packs, and then you can also get it on the bolt. Um, but we don't have it in printer sheets yet. Uh, Mary says, is there a pen to transfer designs to the towels? So we do have um, heat transfer pens, um, but you will see those pen markings beneath your thread work. Um, so if that does not bother you, we have heat transfer pens. They come in all kinds of colors um, at sulky.com. And what you would want to do is actually um, reverse image. So you'll print out the um, embroidery design you want to transfer, and then you'll reverse it and trace over it its mirror image. You'll trace its mirror image using the heat transfer pens. Then you'll place that onto your fabric or towel on the right side and apply an iron to transfer um, your design onto the towel. But again, those are permanent. So um, 
you know, if you're going to do satin stitching or um, a heavier, maybe triple stitch running stitch um, along your design, you won't really see uh, any of your marks uh, once your embroidery is complete. So if that is the transfer me method that you prefer, you certainly could do that. But I love the stick and stitch because you can print it directly from your printer. It's such a time saver. You can also draw on those stick and stitch sheets. So if you want to do your own design and transfer it uh, without any marks or, you know, anything like that, you can draw on it as well and use it as a sticker and then sew through all layers, finish your embroidery and rinse it all away. All right. Susan says, can you use that in a laser printer? Yes, you can. You can use it in a laser or an inkjet printer. Um, oh, Harriet has a great tip. Uh, she says, my grandmother told me to soak red overnight in salt water to stop it from bleeding. It seems to work for me. Great tip. I have never tried that. So thank you for sharing that. All right. Um, the sticky solvy. Oh, using it in the laser printer. Yes. So you can use stick and stitch or the sticky Fabrisolvi sheets in your home printer, whether it's a laser printer or an inkjet printer. So uh, things to note, as I mentioned before, set your ink to the lowest ink setting if that is possible, and then make sure you're printing on the fabric-like side, not on the paper backing that you're going to remove once you've created your sticker. Cut around the outside perimeter of your design, leaving yourself a little bit of a border. Stick it to the right side of your project. Sew through all the layers. It's also great for free motion quilting or free motion embroidery. You can drop your feed dogs, sew right over the top of your lines, and then rinse all of that away. Nobody has to know that you didn't improv the entire piece at the sewing machine. All right. Um, Elaine also says, I use a product by Shout called Color Catcher. You can actually put black, white, red colors all together and it absorbs the dye and doesn't bleed and works wonders. All right. Thank you for all of these tips. See, we've all had this problem, so there are a lot of solutions for it. So that's great. <laughs> all right. So those are our new red work uh, designs available at sulky.com. And I'm going to be giving away our Machine Embroidery Home Sweet Home Design Collection to one lucky viewer who is watching right now, commenting, sharing, liking, giving me those great emojis. As long as you're doing that, you are automatically eligible to win today's gift. So the Machine Embroidery Collection for this Vintage Red Work Embroideries um, is valued at $19.99. And if you're interested in the hand embroidery version to get all of those great patterns, that's $9.99. All available on the Sulky website as a digital product. All right. Lots of say people saying they would love to win. Um, so keep bringing me those comments and emojis, and I will pick one lucky winner uh, um, maybe tomorrow. We'll give people a little bit of um, time to respond. So I thought you all might want a little bit of Easter inspiration as well if you are maybe hosting a brunch or having some people over for Easter weekend, um, or if you just like bunnies and you wanna celebrate, you know, bunnies jumping all over the place, that's a thing too. Um, I have my log cabin bunny quilt hanging behind me here. This tutorial is available on the Sulky blog and I link directly to it in today's post if you wanna make this easy log cabin quilt. And all I did to make it a bunny quilt was to pick a really cute um, bunny uh, motif fabric for my center squares. You could also use a solid fabric for the center squares and add some machine embroidery to it. We have some really, really cute uh, bunny themed machine embroidery designs at sulky.com and I'll show you those momentarily. But since I was talking about how to make that liquid solvy, I thought I would give you a really fun project that you can make using liquid solvy. So if you've got those scraps, this is a really fun way to use them. 
and you can even involve the kids. So if you're having kids, grandkids, nieces, nephews, whoever over to celebrate Easter or spring or what have you, this is a really fun project to get everybody involved in a little craft while they're waiting for brunch or dinner to be served or just something fun to do for the afternoon, maybe after an egg hunt or something like this. So these are actually uh, thread eggs, we'll call them. So these eggs are made entirely out of thread. So another great way to use up, if you've got some thread spools that have just a little bit of thread on them and it wouldn't get you through a project, grab up all of those because we're gonna use all of those odds and ends to make really colorful thread eggs. You can make these any size. So what you're gonna do is blow up a balloon to the size of egg you want to create. All right, then starting with um, the thread end, and you can use all different types of thread, thread weights, thread types, use cotton thread, rayon thread, 30 weight, 40 weight, whatever you have on hand. Um, or you could theme all of these with some really beautiful Eastery colors. We have a 30 weight blendables thread um, that I believe is just called Easter basket or Easter something. Um, and it has all of those great pastel colors. So those would be really cute too. Anyways, you're going to grab the first thread end and secure it with your thumb and start wrapping your balloon all different ways with the thread. Make sure that you secure that thread end really nice and tightly. And so do a few wraps going, um, you know, in the same direction. And then you could start rotating your balloon and adding more and more thread. Um, you could see now we're going the opposite or now we're going from side to side wrapping, right? So different layers. And then we're going to fill the sucker. Okay. You could also add in some um, bits of, of string or yarn, but I really find that the thread um, gives it a much more delicate look to it. And um, since it's such light, so lightweight, it holds its shape really, really nicely. So this is all thread. And like I said, you could use different colors, mix and match thread types and weights, all of that. So once you have your balloon pretty well covered, we are going to start painting it with that liquid solvy. So you'll take your bits and ends and pieces of original solvy, super solvy, ultra solvy, whatever you have as scraps, or you can cut strips of it and put it in your spray bottle and then add about a quarter cup of water. Let all the solvy dissolve and kind of take a look at it. You want it a little bit cloudy, but not like super milky looking. Okay. So you can add water until you kind of get the consistency that you want. And then you can just simply paint it on, um, you know, using a paintbrush that you don't really care about. Although you can wash it away completely um, when you're com when you're done and reuse that paintbrush as well. So give it a nice, you know, several coats, and then you're gonna pop the balloon, which is gonna leave you with these really cool thread eggs. And I mean. How fun is this? You can make them small um, and fit them on a little egg tray. You can make them a little bit larger and make a centerpiece out of them. I just think they're so fun, really neat. You could even put them on your mantle and add some you know, white Christmas lights or twinkle lights um, in and around them and it would look so, so neat. So uh, get the kids involved, how fun for them. I mean, my kids love just unwinding spools of thread. I can't hang thread spools on my wall because they will grab them and just start pulling the thread off of them. Seriously. Also, if you have some bobbins maybe left over from a project and you know there isn't enough color, it doesn't match anything anymore, this is a great purpose for those too. Um, because you know, nothing is worse, honestly. Well, there's plenty of worse things, but I hate having to unwind bobbins and then, you know, 
throw that thread away. What a waste. So this would be a really great uh, repurpose for those types of things as well. So thread eggs, who knew, right? All right, so here's that log cabin bunny quilt I mentioned that is hanging behind me. So if you're interested in that tutorial, it actually comes together rather quickly because it's just six large quilt blocks. Then you add your borders and sashing pieces, and then you bind your quilt after quilting it um, however you like. So all the tutorial for this entire quilt is on the Sulky blog. Oh, some questions coming in about the eggs. Let me address those. Should you not let the Solvi dry before you pop the balloon? Yes, yes, yes. I'm sorry if I left that out. You want the Solvi to fully dry before you pop that balloon. And then you can adjust um, the amount of Solvi as well. So once you let it dry, if it's feeling, you know, like it's not gonna stand up or you want it a little bit stiffer, paint it again or add some more Solvi strips to your water um, before you paint it again. Let it dry again, see how it feels. I mean, it's kind of like a paper mache effect, really, right? With, with the thread and, and your gooey Solvi water. Um, so yes, thank you for mentioning that. Let it dry 100% completely um, before you pop that balloon. All right. Susan says, how do you get the broken balloon out when you're done? Um, so there's some open areas of that thread and you can manipulate it to get that balloon out. Um, also, the full tutorial for those thread eggs um, are on the Sulky blog and I link directly to it in today's post. So if you're interested in making those, I suggest you head on over, get the full tutorial, um, not just my... Uh, you know, truncated overview, <laughs> and then you'll be able to make those um, no problem. Leslie says the blendable thread would be pretty. Exactly. All right. Cecilia says, I have so much old thread can't use in her machine. So this is a great use. Exactly. If you have some thread where you cannot remember where you bought it or how you acquired it, um, it's probably too old to use in your projects. So um, yes, great idea for that. Bonnie says, love this idea. The grandkids are coming up for spring break. Great thing to keep their little hands busy. Um, I think they will love it. All right, so some more Eastery type things. Whoops, I just showed you that one. Um, we also have a blog post featuring this adorable paper pieced bunny block. This is all foundation paper pieced. And if you like that um, water soluble stabilizer, we have paper solvy. It is water soluble paper that we use for foundation paper piecing. So if you have little bits, like for example, the little nose on this bunny, where it's kind of hard to get in there and rip out the paper that you used in your foundation paper piece pattern, you can just leave it there and wash it away. Um, the other thing is with the larger pieces, you can saturate a Q-tip or a cotton swab with water, run it along the seam line, and just lift up the paper pieces uh, because it will dissolve along the seam line and then no need to tear it away and compromise your stitching. It's a really great product. And you can run it through your printer so you can print your foundation paper piecing pattern directly onto that paper and start stitching away. Um, so if you like this bunny, you can head on over to the Sulky blog and find out where I grabbed it. Um, it is from, let's see, it's not a free pattern, but it's relatively inexpensive and there are some great quilt ideas you can make um, incorporating this cute little bunny. And then the little eyes are added with a little bit of hand embroidery. Not too much, I know. We're, we don't have a million hours in the day, I get it. Um, but just that little touch of the little eyelashes I think is so cute. You could also maybe add some whiskers, maybe using our filane uh, acrylic thread and add a little texture and dimension to your bunny as well. So that's a little fun thing. You could make this into a pot holder or a little table runner, table center piece, um, something like that. 
Uh, Harriet is saying, can you explain paper piecing? All right, well, here's the thing, Harriet. Um, I, I can give you a general overview of paper piecing, but that's a whole episode in and of itself. And we've discussed paper piecing a lot here on So What. You can always refer to our past episodes on our YouTube channel. And you can also consult the Sulky blog and just uh, search for foundation paper piecing and you'll find loads of tutorials, tips and tricks for paper piecing. But in a nutshell, foundation paper piecing is where you actually, actually sew through your paper following the lines. So let me bring this um, bunny back up here. So you'll follow the lines of your pattern, flipping and piecing each piece of your bunny, in this case, um, according to your paper pattern. So you're sewing through this paper, and then when your entire block is complete, you remove those pieces of paper along the seam lines. So Sulky Paper Solvy allows you to remove that paper using a little bit of water instead of tearing it along the seam line, which is what is traditionally done um, in foundation paper piecing. So um, there's so many foundation paper piecing patterns out there that it's great for using up fabric scraps uh, because instead of piecing together these larger pieces of fabric and then cutting them away and trimming them away, you're using pieces that are just the size that you need, let's say to create that little nose um, and so it's a very economical way of piecing and you can create really cool, you know, large style gemstones from MJ Kinman that we have on our website um, to smaller things like this bunny. Um, there's also English paper piecing, which is similar um, in the regard that you are sewing through paper or using paper within your fabric um, to act as your pattern. Um, or to act as your guide for sewing. But English paper piecing is traditionally done by hand, while foundation paper piecing is done by machine. So I hope that that's a good enough overview for you. And if you're interested in hearing more about that, you can head on over to the Sulky blog. Um, Cindy says, do you need to remove the larger pieces of the Solvy paper, or can you just leave them in and wash them away? Um, so it really depends. You certainly can leave it all in, finish your entire quilt even. You can sandwich it with your batting and backing, bind the whole thing if you're making a quilt, and then throw it in the wash and all of that paper solvy will dissolve. Great. I just, you know, in my experience, if I have a large piece, let's say it's larger than three or four inches, um, I will generally remove that with that Q-tippy cotton swabby method along the seam lines. Um, it's just less that I have to rinse away either in the washing machine or under uh, running water. So I like to remove the larger pieces, but you certainly don't have to. Um, and a lot of times foundation paper piecing patterns have a lot of small pieces. So it becomes really tedious and cumbersome to remove those. And sometimes you can pop your stitches, even if you're really careful, um, if the pattern or if the paper um, doesn't get, you know, perforated enough. A lot of the times as well, foundation paper piecing designers will instruct you to use a much shorter stitch length, like a 2.0, um, so that it perforates the uh, paper easier for you. And I just don't like doing that because if I mess up, it's really hard to remove stitches that are so close together. Whereas at 2.5 or 3.0, it's just a little bit easier to remove when I make a mistake, which is with every project. So I have yet to make a project start to finish that I didn't make at least one mistake. All right, uh, what is the paper piecing water soluble called on your site? It is called paper solvy and it comes in eight and a half by 11 sheets so that you can run it through your printer really easily. Uh, does the paper work for creating liquid solvy? I have never used it for that and I don't think so. Um, 
I don't, I, I wouldn't use it for the liquid solvy. I could be wrong. And if I am, I will add a comment um, to the thread on this post. Um, but I think I remember that paper solvy doesn't work as well for that liquid solvy. All right. So let's see. I mentioned cute bunnies. Oh, she's covering my face. And this is just another cute bunny design if you're looking for some Easter inspiration for towels, quilts, table runners, placemats, all of those great things that we like to um, decorate our homes with for the holidays. Uh, this is our bunny gal, and she is from our, um, <laughs> what is the collection called? It just completely left my brain. Um, I'm going to have to look it up because I think after everything I have said today, I, uh, I'm just not, <laughs> I'm not computing anymore, everyone. I apologize. Um, let's see. It is called, the website doesn't even want to tell me. <laughs> Bernie says, making the gal bunny for my granddaughter. Very cute. Oh, it's called Bunny Hop. You guys, I don't know how that escaped me. So our Bunny Hop machine embroidery collection includes six Easter themed embroidery designs plus two bonus designs. So you're really getting eight designs in all in three sizes. I hate when you have to buy a design um, for each size that you might want to use. So we've included three sizes for a four by four, five by seven, and six by 10 hoop. So you can go way up if you wanna create a table centerpiece or something like this. Um, we've got Somebody Loves You, um, Hoppy Easter, our bunny gal shown here, our bunny gent. Um, and these are applique in the hoop embroidery designs. And this bunny, let me enlarge her, our bunny gal, her face and ears are done in sulky felty. So it has a really great softness to her face. You could also use like a minky or another type of plush sort of fleecy fabric uh, for the bunny face and ears. And then for the inner ear, you could use some pink felty just for a little bit different texture. And then the bow is also applique. So you can dive into your fabric stash and find a really cute um, fabric to add to your bunny to create her bow. So if you love this collection and you want all the threads that coordinate with all of the six designs, you can also grab up the collection as an embroidery palette. And then you will have all 10 threads of Sulky Rayon uh, to use in your designs. We also have the designs available for individual purchase. So if one of them is speaking to you more than the others, you can just grab up that one design if you prefer. Phew, all right. I'm glad I could um, figure out the bunny hop. We also have some awesome Easter basket blanks at sulky.com. So if you wanna create a little gift basket for a little one in your life you and grab up, our cute Easter basket blanks, add a name, a monogram, one of our hoppy Easter, excuse me, bunny hop embroidery designs to the front of it. And um, I mean, who wouldn't love that full of Easter goodies? So check those out at sulky.com because we have minimal quantities available of these Easter baskets um, and you'll wanna get them with enough time to add your embroidery and all of that good stuff. And if you need a tutorial for how to embroider these Easter basket blanks, that is also at the Sulky blog um, where you will uh, basically do hoopless embroidery, turn your Easter bucket inside out and embroider in that sort of tunnel situation that I was talking about. But all of those instructions are already on the Sulky blog. So you have that for a great reference. All right, let's see. Gail is bringing us back to the Chateau kit. She says, I just ordered the coat kit in gray. 
I'm looking forward to the class. Awesome. Love Linda and crew. Love them too. Really, really great. They're such great teachers. They really empower you and just make you think that you can sew anything. So if you've never sewn a garment before, um, you know, back to the chateau coat, if you've never sewn a garment before, this is a great starter garment. Um, and you know, it has minimal seams and then you can do whatever kind of embellishments you want, but you're learning how to create two different styles of pocket. Um, you're learning this lap seam construction technique. You're learning how to make sleeves that you don't have to set in. You don't have to deal with an arm's eye because it's this dolman sleeve construction. All right. Thanks for bringing us back to the Chateau Coat. Be sure to register for this video cast and uh, get on the list so that you get reminders for when we're going live. Um, and grab up your kit in gray, egg crew, or that black color. Um, and then while you're at it, add this mystery box to the, oops, I should make sure we have some left here. Um, add the mystery box to your cart so you can grab up that free shipping. Also, don't forget your sulky sticky plus slitting pen. This is going to be your best friend in your sewing room. I always keep mine in my little thimble. Um, we also have these at sulky.com. <laughs> these are all my go-to sewing notions. It's kind of getting out of control. I might need to clean it up a bit, but I always keep mine in there because I, um, you know, tend to misplace stuff in here. <laughs> There's just so many projects going on. All right. Don says, so much inspiration. My machine is going to be so busy. All right. Well, that's the whole point is to inspire you to get at your sewing machine today and through the week and maybe even this weekend. Um, so I am um, glad to hear that I've inspired you to do that. All right. Thanks for joining me today, everybody. Be sure to register for our video cast on April 11th. And uh, I will see you next Tuesday for another So What?